Hello, and welcome to this session of the Care Map updates for the Care Maps that are going to be released on February 13th, 2024, on the Shared Health website. So, with these Care Maps here, we're going to be focusing more on the cardiac based Care Maps. So, we're going to be reviewing more of the things that affect the cardiovascular system. So, the first we're going to look at is the updates and changes to C08, the left ventricular assist device Care Map, or the LVAD. So, with this Care Map, the indications for using this care map are all patients with a left ventricular assist device, regardless of chief complaint. Uh, so obviously with this, if the patient has an LVAD, we're going to access this care map, okay? So we have to keep in mind though, when we answer, like when we respond to these 911 calls for left ventricular assist devices, patients and their caregivers are well-trained in troubleshooting for these and management of these devices, and probably will have contacted their LVAD coordinator or their um, cardiologist before contacting us for calling 911. So with that, it could be something that they basically need transport for, or it's something they can't really deal with on their own. So very common things we're gonna be dealing with when it comes to LVAD patients here. Uh, so usually it's bleeding, sepsis, and strokes. So again, clot formations could be bleeding from the site, or another one, sepsis. So just for a quick review here, we're gonna go over what it looks like when these patients get infections of their drive lines. And if you're not familiar with how LVADs work, the drive line is what ins inserts into the actual patient's body to connect the um, control device to the actual device in their in their heart. So with that, a healthy drive line should have little no redness, no drainness. The skin is incorporated, so you can see here it's actually stuck. It's a wrapped around the drive line, and there's no tenderness, discomfort, anything like that. So sometimes though, they could be a terror trauma to exit sign. So they drop their site or they like, so they drop their controller, the skin might've pulled away or um, there might be slight tenderness. There might be some drainage of fluid from there. And we're gonna note the amount of color. There might be some slight redness as well. So basically with that, that can be just the line has become dislodged and that could totally value a uh, trip to St. Boniface. But if it starts getting infected, the redness might start increasing, drainage is gonna start increasing from the site. And again, if there is any kind of exudate out of there, you're gonna wanna know the amount, color and odor of it. And is it really tender to the site? And is the skin pulled away from the drive line? So as you can see here, it's not compared to the first one, it's not nicely connected around that drive line. It's come loose, it's separated. So with that, once we start really getting effect, uh, concerned about infection here. So there's a large amount of redness at the site. There's a large amount of drainage. It's actually gonna be painful and the skin is completely pulled away from the drive line. So these patients are obviously gonna need a ride to the hospital to get these inspected and treated. Again, just some more examples here, uh, patients with drive line infection. So first one there, A, you've got drive line with purulent discharge. You can see on the dressing there, it's discharged a lot. The skin is definitely away from the drive line there. Same thing with B. Um, it's a lot of redness of the skin uh, caused by injury and other inflammation causing this condition. So again, these are things to look for. Those aren't what they should be looking like. So contraindications to using the LVAD care map is not really applicable because if they don't have an LVAD, we're just not going to access this. This is just for patients with LVADs in place. So in the new care map here, uh, the first thing we're going to do is start the left side of the new care map flowchart and is the chief complaint cardiac? If the answer is no, so they're having something else going on there, we're going to consult online medical as soon as possible if the chief complaint is not cardiac at all. Um, they may still get you to call in the LVAC coordinator if required, but again, if it's something not specifically to that, if we need direction, we call online medical, not the LVAC coordinator. And we could also just manage as per the appropriate care map. So if they break their leg, we treat it as a broken leg. They just happen to be an LVAD patient with a broken leg. But when it comes to destination decisions, we still might want to discuss with online medical what's better taken to the city or just go to the closest hospital. And if you are going to transport, if you're within 60 minutes in Winnipeg, ideally proceed to St. Boniface and Merge. If you're beyond 60 minutes, you must contact online medical for destination and decision support. Okay, so you do have those options there for transport. If the chief complaint is cardiac, we're going to the right side of the care map. Uh, so with that, we're going to obviously make sure they're breathing. We're going to check to see if they're conscious or not. And we're going to look at their device tag and see if they have a heart mate two or three. So in the actual care map itself in Appendix B, it has a quick reference for troubleshooting and the different heart mate devices there. It also says in the care app here, we want to listen for the precordial VAD hum. So you should hear when you also take a humming or whirling sound, uh, it's best heard in the precordium there. So when you look at the picture there, uh, that fifth intercostal phase, mid 
midclavicular line. That's ideally we want to listen. It also has the oscillation point tricuspid area. Those are the two best areas you're going to be listening to because as you can see in the picture next to it, that's basically where the alvad pump is going to be sitting. So we want to try and listen for that hum or that whirling sound. So with that as well, if it is a cardiac issue, uh, we want to consult the VAC coordinator through the St. Boniface Hospital paging operator. The, care, the phone number is in the bottom right corner of the care map itself. They can give you direction and support in regards to what to do, whether it's just, you know, I'm just getting the ambulance, bring them here versus do this while you're en route. We can get direction from them. So if they have no VAD hum, they're not conscious, they're not breathing, we're going to assume they're in cardiac arrest at this point. So with both the HeartMate 2 and 3, they have continuous flow pumps. They may not be able to feel a pulse, and it may be able to differentiate extremely low perfusion from a true cardiac arrest. So again, if their pump is working, we feel for carotid pulses, it may not be there. So we can't really use pulses as a determination of death. Um, we're going to go with that we're not oscillating any hum. So the pump's not doing anything. They're not breathing. They're not conscious. Then we're going to assume that it's a cardiac arrest. So the patient's not conscious, no breathing, no hum. Uh, we're going to assume the patient's to rest, start resuscitation, and we're going to just do as per the norm. So new chest compressions, defibrillations, we can pace these patients. Uh, we can use any cardiac meds. They can be done on an LVAD patient. The idea is that nowadays they're putting LVADs into patients that ha just have decreased cardiac function, not completely zero cardiac function. So if we can resuscitate them enough to get whatever heart function they have left back up and running, it might be enough to get them to St. Boniface where they can help fix the pump with the patient. One big thing, though, is if you are dealing with an LVAC cardiac arrest, you cannot call it on scene unless, obviously, like there's, you know, those signs that are determination to death, like their heads cut off. Uh, we can't call these patients on scene. We have to call on medical first before we call an LVAC patient on scene. If the patient is conscious and breathing but no, has no hum, uh, we can assist with troubleshooting. So again, usually the family and the caregivers are well versed in how to deal with these LVADs. It doesn't mean that they're not going to make mistakes or they're going to get confused. Um, so with that, it could be that we make a phone call. There is troubleshooting, like I said, in the care map. Um, but we can look at it and the patient's a stable patient may rapidly go into acute heart failure. So if, the, if there is no harm, it could be that the pump stopped. Again, some of these patients may have minimal cardiac functions. So they may still be perfusing something, but it they could rapidly go into acute heart failure, pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock, because whatever heart functions left obviously isn't effective enough. Okay. So there is another reference in the different care maps. So in H02, left ventricular cyst device, it is like a book. It's a miniature book on how to troubleshoot LVADs. I'm not going to put it in the presentation because it's a whole thing. Uh, but it is currently available in the shared health care maps there. So if you want to look it up, feel free. I'd recommend looking it up as you're going to the LV these LVAD patients to help assist with troubleshooting as required. So next thing down there, so we do have an LVAD hum, but there's a low flow alarm. So with that, there's a red heart alarm on the HeartMate 3. If it's flashing, it indicates the flow may be too low and the patient may be hypovolemic or have right heart failure. So if the chest is clear, so I definitely also take the chest first, because like I said, if their LVAD's not working, they can get pulmonary edema very quickly. So if the chest is clear, consider administering IV fluid by bolus, so 5 to 10 mLs per kg, and then reassess. If they've still got clear ch chest sounds, there's no crackles or anything, doesn't sound like they've got fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema, we can try another bolus. If that doesn't work, then we could look at maybe we just transport and or call the LVAD coordinator for further direction. Big thing is with this, like I kind of mentioned before, are you within 60 minutes of Winnipeg? If no, um, you ideally want to call only medical. So with that, we want to transport. You can go to the closest facility, but ideally we want to get these patients to the city. So we can contact on the medical for redirect. Um, but if you're within 60 minutes, we're just going to go straight to St. Boniface. Okay. Big thing is if you're transporting these patients, all make sure all their LVAD equipment and the patient caregiver come with you so they're not we're not going to go by ourselves so obviously if they're more versed in it than we are it'd be nice to have that person along and more of an expert in this device uh, and all their accessories extra batteries stuff like that bring it all with you and provide pr appropriate pre-arrival notifications so again contact the LVAC coordinator if you already talked to them and said hey yeah we tried everything we're kind of bringing the patient to St. Boniface so they have a heads up so they know the patient's coming and make sure to give the ER enough heads up as well so they know they were coming as well so they coordinate what kind of care this patient might need. And that's the new left ventricular assist device care map. So the next one here is the E04A ACS and STEMI. 
there just hasn't been too many drastic changes to this care map. There's just been a bit of an update. So it's really just been reformatted into a new flow chart here, um, just to kind of streamline it. And with that uh, new addition though, is Appendix A, checklist for fibrinolysis with TNK checklist should be completed while waiting for the co semi position. So this can be done by your partner while you're waiting to get a hold of the cardiologist, or it can be done by yourself while you're waiting to get a hold of the cardiologist. But ideally, these are, these are things they're gonna need to know based on whether we can transport this patient to the pro facility or just go to the closest facility, um, depending on what the patient's condition is. So ideally trying to get this checklist done. And as you can see here, it's just a lot of check boxes and we can talk to the patient about that. And that's really updates to ACS and STEMI. So nothing too huge in that department. Uh, another care map that is actually new is E11 hyperkalemia. So we didn't have this care map before. We used to just have the M10 medication document for hyperkalemia and just reference to dealing with hyperkalemia in our resuscitation care map. So now E11 is gonna be published and it's dealing specifically with hyperkalemic patients. So indications using this care map are cardiac arrest and dialysis dependent patients, uh, known or suspected hyperkalemia in a non-arrested patient. Dialysis dependent patient with one or more of the following. So they missed at least one scheduled dialysis treatment. And with this, the patient may be asymptomatic with severe hyperkalemia. Um, and with that, symptoms usually involve cardiac or skeletal muscle. So with that, we're gonna look for muscle weakness paralysis, heart palpitations, they're presyncopal or they've had a syncopal episode. And we're gonna look for cardiac conduction abnormalities. So arrhythmias, electrocardiographic findings, anything abnormal like that. So we definitely wanna put these patients on the monitor sooner than later. So this used to be a reference document in itself and the age documents has now been put into E11 hyperkalemia as Appendix A. So it's electrocardiographic features of hyperkalemia. So rhythm abnormalities usually occur when the serum potassium reaches approximately seven. So as you can see in this picture here, but it can appear lower if there is a sunrise potassium. So if all of a sudden their potassium goes up very quickly, we might see these EKG changes happen quicker. So with that, patients can rapidly progress from an apparently normal ECG to cardiac arrest. So we definitely, like I said before, these patients need to go to the monitor. We want to look for these abnormalities. So contraindication to the care map is if your patient goes in cardiac arrest, we're not going to use E11 as our guideline for the cardiac arrest patient. We're going to use our resuscitation care maps, and we're going to use this care map concordantly alongside it. So that way we can deal with the cardiac arrest, but also do with the hyperkalemia at the same time. The idea is that we just don't use hyperkalemia for a hyperkalemic arrest patient. We're going to use our resuscitation guidelines that takes priority, and we're going to use our hyperkalemia care map here to deal with the hyperkalemia during the arrest. So with that, uh, start with an assessment, make sure the airway is patented and support or assist ventilations as needed. So what can happen to these patients is respiratory acidosis from hypoventilation can cause potassium to move from the intracellular to extracellular environment, raising serum levels. So like I was saying, they can get that rapid increase of the potassium. So one thing we can do if we are going to ventilate them, we can hyperventilate, can hyperventilate them because it can temporarily lower the, lower the potassium levels by shifting it back into the cells. Um, thing we have to be careful of, respiratory alkalosis occurs when the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less than 36, which results in reduction of hydrogen ion in the intracellular fluid. This causes extracellular potassium ion to shift into the cells. Okay, So with that, we can try hyperventilating for a while. It's going to be, again, if you can, try to use end tidal because like I was saying, uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide less than 36, uh, it's going to help shift that potassium but we don't want to get them too hyperventilated so we're getting below the normals of between 35 to 45. so we try and get the end title in there to try and keep their off carbon dioxide levels lower to help that with that potassium shift if you're going to be ventilating these patients we obviously like i mentioned before i want to put these patients on the monitor defibrillator and get iv access sooner and later okay uh, if they have any fistulas things like that where you're not supposed to use them we are just supposed to use regular iv access or io if it's a you know, in extremis. So for EMRs, you can attach the, I, the AED and immediately contact online medical for direction on treatment of these patients. So if vascular access is delayed or not possible, so we can give 16 inhalations of butamol and repeat as necessary as stated in med document M15. And again, the high dose of salbutamol also causes that potassium shift back into the cells. So as ICPs, you can administer one to two grams of calcium chloride as per M26. So IV calcium causes uh, membrane stabilization of the cell membranes in the heart. Uh, so with that, basically, we're just going to be giving that calcium to help stabilize the heart cells so that way we can get better cardiac function and hopefully can re you know, respond better to our therapy. 
Another medication that ICPs can administer is we're going to give one or two amps or 50 to 100 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb as per M18. So with that, sodium bicarb can assist in lowering the serum potassium fibrokinemia by alkalizing systemic blood volume and causing the intracellular shift of potassium via hydrogen and potassium exchange. So kind of like the same idea we're doing with the hyperventilation, uh, we're just going to change the pH of basically their blood and it's going to cause a potassium shift. In a non-cardiac arrest patient, if we're giving these medications, we should be given by slow push over two to three minutes. Don't just hammer them in, okay? It's gonna, we're gonna have to give it a little bit of time. And to ensure, and make sure to thoroughly flush the line in between these two medications because sodium bicarb and calcium are not compatible in the same line at the same time. They actually create, cause a precipitate. So you wanna make sure if you give calcium, flush it, the line right after, and then you're safe to give sodium bicarb, okay? So with that, if ECG findings persist, repeat calcium sodium bicarb in five minutes. So we're gonna give our meds, again, slow push it over a while there. And then we're gonna keep an eye on the monitor and or keep reassessing our patient and see if there's improvement. If there isn't, we can repeat these medications in five minutes. If symptoms or ECG findings recur, uh, we can repeat calcium chloride and sodium bicarb every 30, 60 minutes as required. So that's a lot. So, you know, honestly, uh, we may not carry that much on our ambulances. You may have to call for an intercept or stop at a reason at a near facility to try and get this patient taken care of. Ideally, these patients need to go to dialysis facility, but we also need to get them there. So if we're looking at longer transport times, you definitely want to keep an eye on their, their overall appearance, obviously, but we need to keep an eye on their heart as well because these patients may not be very stable. And with that, we're going to transport and we want, can contact online medical for possible bypass that dialysis capable facilities. So there are facilities within our zone that do do dialysis on a regular basis. So it could be just a matter of they find a close dialysis ward and see if they can take our patient for an emergent dialysis. And that's online medical. That'd be good for that. And that's the hyperkalemia care map. So again, that's a new care map that is being published on February 13th. So with acute stroke care map here, uh, so with this, we have new timelines and a new algorithm. So this is kind of a big one here. Um, the other thing as well, so we're gonna access this care map if our patient's having a stroke, but also we have to keep in mind that in certain locations, like especially rural ERs, uh, may not be possible for a physician to access a patient in a timely manner. So with that, you may get called for an acute stroke within the facility by a nursing staff. Uh, with that, if we are going into a facility and there's no physician there, we are going to be using our care map and treat it as one of our patients as if it's a primary, even though they're in a facility, if there's no physician available. Okay, so we're going to use this care map. So with that, indications for using this care map, and this is the big one here. So onset within the last 23 hours of a neurological deficit, including any of the following, altered LOC, unilateral weakness or numbness, vision loss, double vision, slurred speech or aphasic. Um, so with that, trumpal comprehending speech and balance. And with that, the big, again, the big change here is within the last 23 hours, okay? So, that's a big jump from what we used to have. So for the purpose of this care map, stroke onset will be defined at the time at which neurological symptoms or signs first appeared, or the time at which the patient was last seen to be at their neurological baseline. So again, if no one's seen grandma for three days and now they show up and she's having stroke-like symptoms, no one's seen her for a couple of days, she wouldn't meet the window. Uh, but if they talked to her last night at say like 8 p.m. and now at 7 a.m. you're getting called, that's well within 23 hours. So that 23 hours definitely lengthens the window for this care map. So contraindications for this, obviously, if they're too uh, unstable to actually look at taking them to a uh, stroke center. So instability of the airway, breathing or circulation, got to be managed with available pre-hospital personnel procedures or equipment. We're just going to go close facility. If their DCS is too low to do a proper assessment, we're going to close facilities. And symptoms of signs due to hypoglycemia um, and resolve when we get their blood sugars back up to normal levels. Or they have a healthcare directive that indicates that they are comfort care only. We're not going to use this care map. If you do have a concern about that, you can contact online medical for direction what to do with these patients. So ideally when we get there, even though we have that larger window now, we're still gonna minimize scene time. Uh, we're gonna ensure their airway breathing circulation, make sure you do a blood sugar. There'd be nothing worse than showing up the stroke center, uh, lights and sirens, and it turns out your patient's just got a low blood sugar. So just please remember to check your blood sugar and please don't give them anything to eat or drink if you can avoid it, okay? Because these patients might need to go in for surgery. So that obviously can create some issues. 
So I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. So, but it is in Appendix A. You're going to do a full stroke assessment. So ensure to perform as thorough a stroke assessment as possible, along with patient history, including a LAM score, as listed in Appendix A. So they actually has the LAM score in there as well. So we're going to get a calculate a LAM score because the neurologist is going to want to know all this stuff. So with that, uh, have symptoms, signs resolved, or a patient will arrive at close the stroke center more than 23 hours after onset? We're just going to go to close this ED. If the answer is no, or is the patient on an, on an anticoagulant? So this is important because patients on anticoagulants cannot receive intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, some may be suitable for endovascular thrombectomy, available only at HSC. So they really need to know this. So we have to make sure we ask about patients' medications as part of our assessment there. And if you're not sure what the medications they have in H11 here in the care maps, it actually has a list of all the anticoagulants or the more common ones. So that has the generic name, the Canadian and the American ones. So if you have people coming visiting from the States, it's all in the list here. So we can reference this care map as well. So you don't have to Google everything. Um, if the patient's not an anticoagulant, can the patient arrive at any stroke center within three and a half hours of onset? If the, the answer is yes, we're gonna go to the closest stroke center. And in table one here in the care map, it's got your Manitoba stroke centers. And so with that, again, just the list here. Um, with that, if we go to even one of these stroke centers, there's a, you know, you know not HSC. If we go to HSC, we're at HSC. But if you go to any other stroke centers, a good chance this patient's going to end up at HSC. So this is why the hospitals like Kenora and in uh, Saskatchewan are not on here. They want us to stay within Manitoba just to keep it closer to HSC. So try not to go out of province with these patients. So if you can't get to the closest stroke center, uh, call a stroke neurologist ASAP and during transport if HSC is close to stroke center. So with that, again, for E zone, nine times out of 10, we're gonna be going to HSC. So with that, call the stroke neurologist as soon as possible during transport and we're going to ask to call talk to the on-call stroke neurologist for a stroke 25 outside call and again the number for hsc paging is in the care map there at the bottom right corner okay so we're going to hsc call hsc as soon as you can if the patient is on an anticoagulant and they can't arrive at the stroke center within three and a half hours of onset can the patient arrive at hsc within six hours of onset with that, if the answer is yes, we're going to call a stroke neurologist before transport. And then we're going to call a transport position and see if we can get a helicopter intercept. So with that, if we can get to HSC within six hours of onset, we're going to start heading there. And like we talked about before, you're going to contact the stroke neurologist and talk to them. We don't tell the stroke neurologist, yes, we can get there within six hours if we get a helicopter. It doesn't work like that. It's we tell them, yes, we can get there within six hours if they accept our patient. Then we can contact dispatch and ask for, see if like there's an air transport available. Because again, if they can get there faster by air, great. But at least that we know that they've accepted our patient because if HS, HSC is a finite resource. So if they're completely overwhelmed in the stroke department, like we can't take another person, go to this facility here. Um, there's no point in calling a helicopter if HSC doesn't want our patient. So that's why we need to contact the neurologist first. Then we can call dispatch and talk to the transport physician about getting an intercept. Uh, if the patient destination is to be HSC, the stroke neurologist may also request paramedics to talk to vectors who can provide stroke 25 activation at HSC and pre-register the patient. So that's when they want the FIN number and everything for the patient if we have it. Um, that way when we get to the HSC, and this is again, either one that within 3.5 or six hours, if we get to HSC, we can just go straight, straight into the CT department. We don't have to wait in the hallway. We don't have to wait for triage. We can just go in and directly go because that's all been taken care of with vectors. I've been hearing that's been going on already. Uh, that's why they want us to contact vectors so they can start things on their side so we can just go straight to CT and they can get diagnosed faster than waiting in the hallway and getting triaged. If you're unable to arrive at HSC within six hours to onset and you're not within one hour of any other stroke center, just go to close this ED. Uh, if you're within one hour of another stroke center, go to that stroke center. And that is the new update to stroke, acute stroke. So again, that window at the top there with the 23 hours, that's definitely changed things. So just something to keep in mind. And that's the updates for the cardiovascular care maps being published on February 13th. Thank you very much.